All right, so my name is uh, Bruno Velasquez. I'm the animation director at Sony Santa Monica. Uh, I've been with the studio since uh, 2006, so I had a long relationship with Kratos, so about 13 years or so. Uh, my first game at the studio was God of War II, and uh, that was a great experience working uh, with uh, Corey Barlog as a game director. And for this latest project, I uh, had the opportunity to work with him again, which was great. Uh, this is my first animation boot camp, so this is amazing that I get to uh, be here with all of you guys, uh, talk about animation. It's amazing. I'm so happy to be here. So thank you for having me. And uh, the name of my talk is God of War, Breathing New Life into a Hardened Spartan. So uh, God of War, it's a uh, franchise from Sony. Uh, it's uh, on the eighth game now. Uh, the, the latest one came out last year. And it certain centers around a uh, Spartan named Kratos. Uh, the first seven games pretty much uh, delved into uh, Greek mythology. And the latest one, we decided to take it into the Norse realm. Now, one of the biggest things uh, when Cory Barlog first uh, set off to give us the mission on how we were going to make this game, one of the challenges for animation was how we're going to reimagine Kratos. How are we going to present him in a new light? Uh, we kind of wanted to not completely throw everything away that we did in the past before, but we want to kind of depict them in a new light, present them in a new way um, for new audiences, and also to please the fans that had been with us for so long. So our first mission was to reimagine Kratos. How are we going to do that? So most everybody knows Kratos this way. They remember him from the previous games in a path of vengeance and rage and destruction. Um, you know, he was, that was, that's a, was his mission, right? It was to get revenge, to get payback from the gods. So in order to kind of change a little bit of that perception, we needed to focus on the humanity. So we need to make a conscious effort on how we're gonna show more of the human side of Kratos. So from an animation standpoint, we, that was a, a very interesting challenge for us. So when you think of a character like the Hulk, uh, I had to do make my own drawing just to, to be safe. Um, don't want to make anybody mad at me. Uh, but uh, when you think of a character like the Hulk, you know, there's two sides of him, right? There's, there's the Hulk side, the angry green guy, and then there's Banner, there's a the human side. So what we needed to do was uh, explore that for Kratos. You know? Does Kratos, what about Kratos? Does Kratos have that side? Or is he all just full of rage? Right? So if you look back into the previous games, there were little glimpses of that humanity. You know, we didn't show them very often, but there was a little bit, right? Um, he, at one point, wanted to save his brother, um, wanted to, to rescue him once he found out that he was still alive. Um, his brother Demos was, you know, fought alongside with him for a little bit before he lost him again. There was moments where he showed uh, compassion and care for his family, you know, um, even though he ended up tragically, by mistake, killing them. But there was glimpses there that he, you know, he missed them. Uh, he wanted to embrace them and be with them once again. And of course, the moment of regret and remorse where he pretty much wanted to end it all. He wanted to move on. Um, he couldn't deal with it. So definitely, as much as we showed moments of, uh, <clears throat> of power and strength in Kratos, there was also a little bit of, of, of the human side kind of sprinkled throughout the games. You know, it wasn't all about ripping people's heads off. Well, actually, it kind of was <laughs> most of the time, right? But we had to basically ask ourselves, how are we going to go from this to something like this? Where Kratos is going to be a teacher, a mentor, uh, a protector. Um, that was just something that um, you know, we hadn't done much of before. So one of the first things that we did is we looked at uh, his proportions. Um, if we wanted to have uh, someone that people can sympathize with more, uh, we need to re revisit the way he looked a bit. This is Kratos from the previous games. The proportions are a bit wacky, I got to admit. You know, he's got super long arms, super long legs, a tiny head. I mean, look at his hands. He, he, can, he can crush his own head, you know, just <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit off, right? But in the end, for what we needed 
these proportions for, it kind of worked out. You know, he, we were going for more of this uh, comic book over the top style in the previous games. So um, those proportions kind of read well in the poses that we needed him to be. Uh, not to mention that uh, the perspective uh, of the game was much farther away. So he needed to read a lot clearer. So those proportions work well. Now, one of the first things I did um, once Corey gave me the direction of like, well, you know, he's gonna be a father figure, he's gonna have a son. Um, so I just kind of scrambled and, and looked for some old models or just grabbed whatever we had at the time at the beginning of the project. Started posting Kratos out in this different situations. In this case, I just grabbed, uh, actually that's his, uh, his brother Demos as a kid. So it's a little weird to have you know, his younger, younger brother there, but that was all we had to represent Atreus at the time. So in these, um, you know, I kind of just wanted to explore uh, what it would feel like uh, for Kratos to be a protector and also a teacher and a mentor. Um, so here are some early poses of, of him teaching his son how to, how to hunt, how to use the bow, and also a situation which you would never really see in the previous games, just sitting down and talking, having a conversation, eating, <laughs> drinking. When did Kratos ever do that, right? So we wanted to, to start exploring those things. But as you can see, uh, the proportions, you know, the old models, you know, it still was a little bit off. So as the script uh, progressed, um, there was a couple of scenes that we found out about where Kratos, you know, the son was going to be sick at one point. Kratos had to put his hand on his son's shoulder at one point, even though it took him a little bit of time to do that in the game. <clears throat> he was also meant to carry him at one point in his back um, during the climbing sequences. So, so I started posting, posting this uh, old models. And as you can see, yes, the proportions needed some, some development in order for, for him to feel a little bit more human. So the concept art team started working on that. Uh, as you can see, this is very, uh, some early concept where he started to, they started taking inspiration from the previous games and the way that he looked. I started adding the beard, starting adding the uh, Norse motifs to him. And uh, as you can see, he has a, a bit more of a, a human proportions, uh, a little bit closer to a, a more relatable human. Um, even his weapon, as you can see uh, at, the, at, at the early stages, there was no, it wasn't a magical axe. It was just a, a, a simple weapon that he was to use. Um, the direction of the game early on was very grounded. Uh, it was meant to be a lot more realistic. And uh, in, in the early beginnings, as I, was, as I will show you, um, some of the early animation was very grounded and, and more, um, not as sort of, over top as it ended up being. Uh, so we had to dial that in to make, it, uh, to make it work with the direction of the game. Here's a uh, shot of uh, the 3D model uh, as it was making progress. Uh, this is around the time of the uh, E3 uh, reveal um, in 2016. The first time that we showed Kratos to the public, the new Kratos emerging from the shadows. So as you can see already, he was starting to feel a little more more human you know, than, than how we previously depicted him. But of course, he needed to, again, interact with his son. So even though um, he had more human-like uh, proportions now, he still needed to feel like a giant amongst men. So even the interactions with the son, um, you know, while they worked in the game, he was still a pretty large, large man. The next thing that we needed to uh, look into was uh, posing. You know, how are we gonna create our poses in our animation to best depict Kratos in this new light? You know, an older, grounded, uh, sort of more weathered warrior. So looking back at the previous uh, games, this is our, some of the poses that, you know, we went for more, you know, heavy metal magazine cover type of uh, look, comic book over the top. And many of these poses, what's interesting about these poses is that many of these poses were done by the animators. So we did not really want uh, other teams, like marketing teams working on our poses as much as possible because we wanted to maintain um, the feel of the character throughout, even in marketing. So I'm sure you know, many of you guys have spent so much time posing, developing base poses for your characters, uh, combat poses. 
And then all of a sudden, marketing comes back with these uh, T-shirts, and you're like, wait, who, who made that post? You know, where did that come from? And that, that, you know, that's pretty horrifying. So we definitely wanted to maintain that uh, across not only uh, the game, but marketing materials as well. So taking this concept of this over-the-top poses, we needed to apply those to our older uh, hardened Spartan. So while we um, did not push it as far as we did in the previous games, we still had hints of that. You know, as you can see in the, uh, his blocking pose, still uh, needed to be dynamic and strong and grounded, but a little more grounded than before. Um, and even when he interacts with, uh, with enemies and kills them, um, yes, it, it's a bit over the top, but it's a little bit more grounded than it used to be before. So we needed to keep that in mind as we were posing anything that had to do with Kratos. You know, animation, combat, idols, anything. He's not quite as hunched down as he used to be overall. That was one of the main things. We didn't want to get him as slow as he was in the previous games. Another aspect of, um, of grounding Kratos was Atreus. So Kratos was there to help his son teach him how to be a god, how to be a warrior, how to survive. But at the same time, uh, the importance of Atreus was there to make Kratos feel more human. In the previous games, Kratos would walk around and meet people and maybe say a word and then kill them most of the time. So we needed to have uh, uh, an emotional anchor. Uh, Atreus was basically there to be the eyes and the voice of the player. You know, Kratos would not, when he would travel in the previous games, he didn't wonder where this, uh, you know, statue came from or, or, or what it said, on, what message was written on the wall. So um, by presenting Atreus and then partnering him up with Kratos, we were able to, you know, sort of get conversations actually happening between two characters, which just didn't happen before. And this way, uh, our goal was for the player to get to know Kratos a little more and to get Kratos out of his comfort zone. And by having a young son there that he needed to look after and interact with, that was, uh, it offered a lot of opportunities for us to do that. Now, a bit of the studio culture too. Um, you know, as the studio grew and the team grew, so did we. <laughs> and many of the team members became parents, we got married, had kids, and that kind of changed the way we, we saw things, you know. Uh, we wanted to tell different types of stories as well. So this was part of the big influence of why we decided to um, reimagine Kratos and make him more re relatable. Uh, previously, it was like the Greek era, it was kind of like the college years, right? Um, you know, a little, having a little more fun. Well, you know, not that we're not having fun still, but uh, the Norse era is a bit more like, okay, you know, let's, uh, let's try to tell uh, some different stories that, you know, perhaps we can share with our kids someday as well, without being too embarrassed. Not that the previous games are embarrassing, but you know, I would definitely wait a while before I would show my daughters those games, that's for sure. And I would have to explain a lot of things. So Kratos uh, was also meant to be a father once more. Uh, we felt that that was the best way for him to have an arc of redemption, um, to have uh, someone that he needs to care for. And that was the best way to, for people to sympathize with him. So speaking about the animation style, we needed to make a, a switch in our animation style if we wanted to depict Kratos in a more relatable way. This is why early on we decided to look into motion capture. Um, so the previous God of War games were primarily uh, keyframe, about 90% was all keyframe, 10% motion captured, and the motion capture was reserved for the cinematics, mainly. Uh, but everything else, including facial animation, was keyframed, all the bosses, uh, combat, enemies, all the Kratos moves. And here's some examples of some of the early um, keyframe animation that we did uh, from the previous games. Uh, as you can see, the, the moves are uh, a little bit more arcadey over the top, um, often we, you know, especially with the blades, we could just create massive arcs where we didn't have to worry about the camera. And, uh, and often we defied the laws of gravity. 
But once we moved into motion capture, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about the process because we hadn't really used it for combat before. So here's an example of a move. Um, and this is uh, data from uh, footage from the motion capture stage. This is the data. As you can see, it got us about you know, 80% of the way, right? And then our animation team would go in and uh, enhance it. Without the keyframe knowledge and experience, we wouldn't be able to do it. Now, these moves are uh, at 60. They're actually exported uh, with a lot more frames. Because then, once we get into the game, the fidelity of the, of the chain blades would, uh, would read a lot better. That's why we had to export those with a little bit higher frame rate. And of course, motion capture gave us the fidelity for scenes like this, where we really needed to um, express a little bit more emotion to try to get Kratos to um, feel more relatable. So motion capture, motion capture gave us um, a bit of a shortcut to get to that a lot faster. Uh, we still had to do a cleanup pass and then keyframe pass and enhance pass on uh, most of our cinematics, but without essentially the amount of the, with the amount of, uh, of scenes that we had to do, um, it would have taken a lot longer to keyframe out everything. It just wouldn't have been possible. So how do we get a uh, team of keyframe animators to, to jump on board with this notion of, oh, hey, we're going to introduce motion capture into this? You know, it, was, it was tough at first. You know? I mean, we, as animators, we, we love to just keyframe everything as much as we can. But motion capture is a tool. Um, and the way we convinced them is we bought an XN suit and we gave it to the animators like here, let's, let's just try some stuff. And what happens when you give a mocap suit to an animator? This happens. HR didn't know a lot of the stuff was coming on upstairs. Uh, we would have had to sign all kinds of waivers. But yeah, we liked it so much that we ended up getting a second suit so that we can do these kind of like paired up moves. And, uh, and by involving the animators in this process, um, it actually you know, got them to kind of start jumping on board. And it's like, okay I, okay, I see how this works. I get to shoot the data. and. You know, I drive the performance a bit, and, and then I get to clean it up, and I get to enhance it and push it. So it's not like I'm eliminating you know, my, my role, my job. I'm actually enhancing it. And then I'm getting a lot of data a lot faster and getting me about 80% of the way. And then we would go in, add the extra layer of awesomeness to it with Keyframe. So um, yeah, this is me. <laughs> also, I decided to jump in and, and try to suit myself. Um, but early on, um, having said that, early on, like I mentioned before, the direction of the game was to be a lot more greedier and grounded and heavier and slower. So this is some of the first bit of data. So yeah, this is uh, exclusive Kratos killing Kratos. <laughs> um, and yeah, and like, as you can see, the axe was just a basic axe. There was nothing fancy about it. Um, it, was, you know, it was meant to be just this you know, really gritty game. Um, so after we had the extent suits, we decided, OK, well, you know, let's try this for real. Let's go over to the mocap stage. Um, but we felt we needed to try it out ourselves. So this is Erica Pinto, our lead cinematics animator, and Mehdi Yusef, our um, lead uh, gameplay animator. So we decided to go on stage ourselves and shoot a scene. So the first scene that we collaborated on that we did together was the ogre intro. Um, there's a moment in the game where this guy comes through the door and attacks Kratos and Atreus. So um, I was Kratos, uh, Mehdi was the ogre. Erica is uh, Atreus in this case. And uh, I just realized that Mehdi is actually holding a cell phone. So I don't know why <laughs> an ogre would need a cell phone, but yeah, he's, he's just uh, he's snuck in there. So. Um, so what we did in order to approach this, because um, another part of the mandate was to do this as a one-take uh, game. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a later slide. 
uh, we decided to go and uh, shoot this in live action first and rehearse it and really rehearse it over and over and over and over. Um, and then before we took it to the stage. So I'll just show you this video and walk you through it. So this is the footage of us rehearsing uh, the whole scene. <laughs> yeah, uh, we had to get creative with the scale, with the sizes to represent the sizes as best as possible. Um, and the, <laughs> that was definitely uh, fun and challenging. Now, this is the, the footage, the video footage feed that was on stage. <laughs> um, and this is how you see the, the scene being shot in Motion Builder, the Motion Builder feed. Now the tricky thing about this scene is that even though everything looks lined up with the camera, the characters are interacting, they were all different sizes. So when we got to the stage, we, we had to deal with it. We actually had to shoot the scene in separate spaces so that the scale, uh, relative world space, um, and we had to rehearse it in a way that we were interacting with each other, but apart from each other. Now, as you can see there, um, Dory, who's our director of, of photography, uh, is holding a marker. This is before we had a uh, virtual camera. And he was actually walking around, pointing the, the marker and looking at the screens up on top to get his framing right, right? So that he can frame all three of us. So he was using Kratos as the anchor um, for the scene and uh, just in order for us to be able to interact with each other in different uh, scales, we had to do that in our own separate acting spaces. Now. What that got us was a scene that had all the characters in a relatively solid timing with the camera all in one, right? And that is when Mehdi had to come in and do the keyframe pass on top. But without this early sort of rough block out of the scene, it just would have taken a lot longer to do, a lot longer to pull off. So he had a very solid base to go off of. And this is what the final scene ended up looking like. So it was definitely a lot of fun to do that. And uh, we got to learn a lot. Um, and as leads, if we went through the process, understood the process, then we can better um, you know, have our animators join in with us and help us out to get this done. Definitely, uh, you know, it went a little bit up to our heads. But then after doing a full day of shooting, we realized that we can't do this ourselves. <laughs> we, need, we need experts, we need professionals to help us do this. But it was great to at least go through that process once and, and, uh, and figure out how, how it all works. So the benefits of motion capture for us, it gave us a solid foundation for our keyframe animators to push things a lot further. We were able to complete over three hours of cinematics in our game. Um, without motion capture, it just would have been really tough. And um, acquiring motion capture data allowed us to focus on you know, other cool things like stuff that couldn't be motion capture, like these scenes that are uh, mostly all keyframed. So the dragon is all keyframed. Uh, Kratos and Atreus is a combination of keyframe and motion capture. And of course, there's no way you can mocap this guy. <laughs> and those guys, and Kratos and Atreus flying through the air, definitely keyframe as well. So it just freed us up. It freed us up to do a lot more of this stuff. So moving a little bit over to the narrative process, um, we also needed to revisit our narrative, narrative process to see how we're going to depict Kratos in a uh, more relatable way. So early on in the project, uh, Corey, he uh, had the idea and the mandate of, I want to do this entire game as a one shot, as a one -er. And the reason for that is he wanted to uh, essentially sell the player on the idea of, you're there with Kratos and Atreus every step of the way. There's no like cutting away to meantime in the bad guy's lair. You know, he's you know, making his plan over there. No, no. He wanted you to be there alongside Kratos for the entirety of the trip so that uh, it felt like you were there taking the trip alongside with them. Um, and this was done to, you know, to enhance the personal narrative. 
between Kratos and, and his son. So early on, we started, uh, how many of you guys have seen the movie Hard Boiled? Show of hands. OK, all right. Not as many as expected, but that's OK. So we looked at a lot of films that had, uh, you know, that had scenes that had no cuts in them for reference and inspiration. But there's one particular scene in the movie called Hard Boil. Uh, it's directed by John Woo. It's a Hong Kong action film. Now, I was unable to secure the rights to show you the scene. So I'll quickly describe it really quickly just to make my point. So in it, uh, it's, there's two detectives, two police officers. There's one named Tequila. I mean, that's his nickname, Tequila. And the other one's Alan. So they're going through this um, hospital, having this intense shootout. All of a sudden, elevator door opens. Alan looks over, shoots someone that's coming out of the elevator, and then realizes that he's wearing an ID. He's a police officer. He just shot a police officer. So he's in shock. So his partner, Tequila, grabs him, drags him into the elevator. The elevator door closes, and he's just sitting there. I can't believe I just shot a police officer. This is, I can't believe I just did. Tequila says, don't worry about it. It wasn't a police officer. Don't worry, we need to get out of this thing. We need to survive this. You gotta keep focus on, on getting, keeping us alive. So the elevator doors open. They go out. Another insane shootout happens. And soon after, Tequila says, oh, by the way, the thing that happened way earlier in the film, I kind of shot a cop too by mistake. And I know it feels horrible. You know, I, I, I can relate to you. And then Alan says, wait a minute, so you're saying that the guy I just shot in the elevator was a police officer? He goes, yeah, yeah, he was, right? And then they go back to insane shootout. Now, everything I just described was all done without a, any cuts, and all with practical effects without any cuts. So how can we take that? So we saw that, and we're like, okay, that's an amazing scene. It had action, almost like gameplay, and went into a, a shocking moment for one of the characters, realizing that he just killed a, a fellow police officer, he gets you know, uh, consoled by his friend, and then his friend reveals to him that, hey, I went through the same thing. And then back to action. So we, wanted, we got inspired by that. We're like, that's amazing. They were able to pull it off in just this one scene. Now how can we do it for the whole game? So this is one of the first scenes uh, early on in um, uh, the E3 demo that we showed that kind of has a bit of that, going from action to an emotional moment back to action. Now, boy! Wait! What? Do it! Off the ice! No! So sorry. I. Your deer is getting away. Yes, sir. So, without cutting away, we were able to have uh, action, uh, a moment, a teaching moment where Curtis is trying to teach the son to take out the creature, to an honest mistake by Atreus, to a moment of bonding between them. You know, so. Uh, that was definitely something that we wanted to carry on throughout the entire game. So we needed help. So we, um, we brought in Dori Arasi. He's a director of photography that helped us get the, uh, everything that was on the script um, planned out and laid out in a way that we can actually execute the one take within the cinematics. So if, um, if you guys have the time to spare, definitely on uh, Wednesday, uh, if you have a chance to go see his talk. He's going to dive a little deeper into the emotional connection through uh, the cinematography in, in our game. So please, if you have a chance to go check it out. Um, <clears throat> because of this one take approach, we had to, uh, appro we basically had to shoot our scenes more like a play. We had to think of it more of a play than a movie. Um, everything had to be done, uh, rehearsed very well and very closely. Uh, because we wanted, to, we wanted you to have the experience of watching a play that was happening in front of you, being in a play that was happening in front of you, rather than um, watching a movie, right? So that was one of the mandates. This is why we had to kind of 
start thinking about plays rather than, than film uh, when we got inspired, our inspirations. Um, and because of this, we had to do a lot of key, a lot of uh, previous, lots and lots and lots of previous. And we employed all sorts of methods for different situations. So when we had things that were just impossible to shoot or where characters had to cover large distances, we used the keyframe method. Uh, this is a, a scene in which Kratos is pushing a, a large hammer and uh, him and his son are writing it down all the way uh, so they could uh, shatter the ice below. But yeah, this is no way we could have done this in any other way uh, to visualize how we were gonna do it. The other method was uh, we were fortunate enough to have a small motion capture space also within our studio um, where we could do previs, we could do um, you know, just simple motions before we went over to the main, main stage. Um, so there were situations where we needed to previs um, characters interacting with the environment or interacting with certain uh, creatures that we just you know, needed to do it in 3D. So yeah, that's, uh, we needed to figure out the scale of this bore. We need to figure out where Freya was gonna be interacting on the shelves, where the characters need to be uh, standing and placed. Um, so this was how we would show this to our director before we would get approval. And then finally, my favorite way of doing previous was live action where the animators uh, had an opportunity to have a bit of fun. And this is uh, uh, just one of the previous scenes that we did of, out of many, many scenes. The reason why we use uh, live action was because we could then go outside, go upstairs, shoot a couple of scenes very quickly, show them to the director, get feedback, and within the same day, we can go shoot them again. And if he had more feedback for that, we could shoot it again. And then it was just, it was just cost effective and the speed of it was, was great. And on top of that, we had to have a lot of fun. That was something that might catch. Oh, that was a perfectly good waste of an hour. How are you not seeing? There is nowhere to hide up here. It's, it's a trick my people have, a special way of not being seen. You can turn it invisible? More like I can step into the realm between realms. <laughs> and your mind can't understand what it's seeing, so it actually sees nothing at all. It's how we avoid using the weapons that we actually craft. Ooh. But it doesn't seem to work on dragons, though. Mm. Your brother wanted to know if you're eating well. I can tell him that you are. Brock asked about me. Was there meat on his breath? Oh. You let him work on this again? Come on. So we have a couple of dwarf characters in our game. So if you're wondering why this walking around on his knees, that's why, so we can get the, the scale uh, approximation right. Um, so shameless plug number two. Um, if you have the chance to also go see Erica Pinto's talk, uh, she's the lead narrative animator. And uh, she will dive a little bit deeper into the process, cinematic process, uh, a lot more than I am doing here. So con continuing on uh, with this principle of, of shooting everything as a play, um, because of that, it became very apparent that we needed to focus on rehearsal a lot more. We couldn't just have actors show up the day of shooting. So we did a lot of table reads. A rehearsal day would look like in the morning get everybody together on the same page, read, all, read the script, get everything uh, planned out. And then we would go step by step through each scene and uh, Dory would uh, film them, live action uh, takes of, of every scene, and then rehearse with them the blocking, the staging, the, the beats uh, connected to the dialogue, where they needed to be, when they needed to be at certain positions. And here's a, a bit of, a, of the rehearsal footage that we did for the opening of the game. So you, some of you guys who may have played the game uh, will recognize this from the opening. And action. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity to get notes over to the actors. Uh, to dial in all the performances.
also to work out where all our props are going to be. And one big one. <laughs> and block out the timing of the camera. So that rehearsal day became uh, very critical. So on shooting day, we did an all-in-one approach. We captured the body data, the face data, the face cams. We did audio recording. Um, so for the final performance, I mean, they, we did have some ADR sessions, but yeah, we pretty much got most of the dialogue on set and uh, also the virtual camera. So by the time a scene was delivered to us, everything was pretty much uh, dialed in with the, with the timing that we wanted. So here's an example of, uh, of us shooting a scene. Uh, Corey is back there with, uh, with the, the writers, with the writers uh, overseeing the scene delivery. And uh, they get, we get to see everything through Motion Builder um, as it's being shot. So as you can see, this is a careful rehearsed dance um, between the actors and Dory to ensure that we hit the beats accurately. And our goal is to do it all in one take. So another important part of the process was casting, getting the right chemistry between our actors. Um, to make Kratos feel more human, the anchor, emotional anchor, was going to be Atreus. Um, luckily, we were able to find the right people for the job. Uh, Christopher Judge as Kratos and Sonny Soljic as Atreus. And um, once we got them together to do their chemistry, chemistry, uh, sorry, chemistry test, as uh, you, I will show you in a second, um, once we got that, we knew we had the right people. Also, something that helped us out was, even though we weren't casting for height, it ended up being that our two star actors pretty much felt like Kratos and Atreus as it is. They were the right, right height. Uh, and then that made the cleanup process and adjustment process a lot, a lot simpler once we uh, did the motion capture. Now, one of the things that people like to say is that, oh, don't work with animals, don't work with kids. But um, for us, it was, there was no other way to go than to actually you know, get a child actor. There's no way that a, I feel that an adult uh, could pretend 100% to be a kid. And it, was, it became apparent early on after we brought Sonny in. Um, this is one time we were just at, sta at the stage, started messing around. I might have said to hit play on the recording. Maybe, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But, um, but yeah, definitely this kind of, uh, this kind of you know, childlike movement, you're not gonna get this from, from an actor, from an adult actor. It, it'll be a lot tougher, you know, it'll be a lot tougher for sure. So this is why, this is why it was important for us to, to bring in Sonny and to work with him. Now, as I mentioned before, the chemistry test, um, we actually hired Atreus first. We found Sonny first, uh, since he was gonna be the emotional anchor for the game. And then we brought the actors um, that were trying out for the part of Kratos to do the chemistry, chemistry test with him to see if it was gonna work. Not fit to be a father. I can try, I cannot change it. I have become everything I never wanted you to be. Run, run far away from me. But you have changed. You're not a monster. That is exactly what I am. Not to me. You will fail. How you deal with it is what makes you stronger. My father taught me. Yeah, so when we saw this, we knew lead the way. we had the right people. All right, so moving uh, over to the combat animation process, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, early on, one of the things that 
was thrown out the door was the Blaze of Chaos. So the Blaze of Chaos have a lot of history. They have a lot of baggage with Kratos. So what better way to present the character in a new light than start stripping away some of the things that were present in his past? So early on, we decided that, and it was very scary. It was like, how do you, how you remove the lightsaber from Luke, right? Like, no, you want to you wanna try to maintain as much as the character as possible. But by stripping away these weapons, it made him feel maybe a little bit different, uh, more vulnerable in a way. But at the same time, we wanted to replace those weapons with another iconic weapon. So this is why we decided to create an, an axe, which is... Um, a little bit more, it fits a little bit better within the Norse mythology that we were moving on to. And it sort of um, fits the, you know, the fantasy of Mjolnir in a way, the Th Thor's weapon, Thor's hammer, where you can throw it and, and summon it. But it wasn't like that at the beginning. Like I mentioned before, the moves were supposed to be very grounded and methodical and not, not very magical at first because the game direction was to be a lot grittier. But as we play tested and we move forward, we discovered that, hey, we need to kind of inject back a little bit of the old God of War games into it. So here's another pass at an early animation where we started like getting a little bit more of that old Kratos moving back. One of the things you notice is that he's actually throwing the ax as a boomerang. Um, this is when we start introducing some of the magical nature of the moves, but they were going to be part of the combo originally. So before you were, there were just going to be button presses and the axe would come out and fly out and hit the enemies and come back automatically. Um, so it wasn't until the breakthrough for the axe was definitely being able to throw it and being able to summon it back. And I mean, that completely ties into the fantasy of Thor, you know, the, the Norse myth. So um, once we did that, it definitely was what got us over the top to, real, to be able to to make this into a, 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 a weapon that would stand side to side with the blades. And in addition to that, the history of the ax was that it was given to him by his, by his wife, rather than being given to him by, by a god for, as a weapon of destruction, right? So it was more of a weapon of protection you know, given to him by his own wife. So already the story behind the weapon was, was different to try to make him feel a little more connected to it in a different way than, than anger and rage. Also, we, to de we had to deal with a new camera, right? So since we needed to be closer in the cinematics and the gameplay, so we had to be closer in the combat. Long uh, were gone the days where we could just do crazy arcs over the top, you know? And even though the blades did make it back uh, as, a, as part of the story, uh, sorry if, uh, spoilers for those of you who have not played the game, but we couldn't get away with, um, with doing these wide arcs anymore because of the camera. We had to be up close. So yes, we still had to animate everything to look good from every angle, but we particularly had to focus on making it look good from a new camera perspective. So as you can see, we pulled in the chains way more, way more than it used to be. It was, it was meant to just read enough with the camera, but still retain the same feeling from the old games. And here's some examples of how both the axe and the blades look from the new camera perspective in game. And as you can see, we definitely moved away from the, the grounded feel. And even though, you know, Kratos is jumping up in the air, but he's not jumping as crazy as he used to in the previous games. So there's a, a nice blend that we were able to achieve between the grounded and, uh, and the previous games. Um, and also to utilize the keyframe animation um, talent that we had in our studio. But having said that, we still needed help to get great motion. So this is where Eric Jacobus comes in. Now, he is an amazing stunt performer, but in addition to that, he's a great director, he's a fight choreographer, and stunt coordinator. So he does pretty much everything. And in addition to that, he has a great understanding of the motion capture process. He's one of the few stuntmen that I know, at least, that um, is interested in um, motion capture technology and how it works and how, how to best use it for, for all kinds of needs. So I came across a YouTube channel, his YouTube channel, and I recommend if you guys um, have time, take a look into his YouTube channel. 
He has an amazing array of short films um, that he's directed and he's put together with this amazing action. And because of that, I was like, whoa, this is, this is great. This guy can, can do a bit of everything. But the thing in his YouTube, ch YouTube channel that uh, really attracted me the most was a series of videos that he created where he was reenacting like moves from games, from fighting games. And let me give you an example of that. Yeah, so he's essentially taking something that was probably mocapped and heavily worked on by animators and keyframed, and then he's just recreating it in a live action, you know? So it's pretty amazing. It's almost like he was doing exactly, exactly what we needed him to do. Um, and having this direction of trying to make things more relatable and grounded, what better way than to get him in to try to do the moves for us, you know? So he would lay out, he would, his performance would give us you know, 80%, 80 to 90% of the way so that we can then take and push them a lot further. So once I saw this video, I said, oh, please, can we contact this guy? Let's get him in, let's get him in, in our building. And, um, and what happened was uh, before his actual audition for, for Kratos, all, all we said is, you're auditioning for Kratos, he has an ax. That's it, that's all we told him. And days before uh, he was meant to come in for his audition, he sent us this all on his own. So as you can see, without any direction at all, he was already like brainstorming all these awesome, cool ideas that we could use. Um, so at that, at that point as well, what, what was revealed to us uh, from that footage was that, okay, yeah, we need, to, we need to work with this guy, but we need to make him part of our team. We need to bring him in. So what we did a lot of uh, was we brought him into the studio, we walked him through the entire story, we explained to him all the Kratos rules, you know, what he can do, what he cannot do, what kind of character he is, what kind of, what kind of personality he has, what type of movement he does. So we really got him involved as almost like one of the members of the anim animation team so that he would truly understand the character. So that it wasn't just about, oh, okay, come in this day, here's your list, and then just, you know, just start acting these moves. You know, just copy what I'm doing, you know. Um, so that was, we tried that at first, and, you know, we got some good data, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite what we, you know, what we could end up doing if we practiced with him more, sort of like how we did with our, our, our actors for their cinematics. So here's an example of uh, one of our animators, James Che, recording sort of the motions that we needed to capture. He's just kind of uh, demoing for Eric ahead of him coming into the studio. And then we brought Eric in and we just spent an entire day rehearsing practicing move just so that we would have this footage ready to go once we went over to the mocap stage. Uh, and by the time we went to the mocap stage, we were very efficient because he knew exactly you know, what to do. We could always bring up the video footage that he himself shot with us and then execute all the moves. So here's an example of a move going through every step. So this is James Previs. Then we bring Eric in. Then on stage, he knows exactly what to do. And we can be a lot more efficient and focus on the quality of the movement rather than, uh, rather than the idea. And this is uh, after it's been polished and enhanced by our animation team. So yeah, keyframe animation is still critical for us to push this this stuff through to the next level. So, in conclusion, I'm, I see I'm running a little bit out of time, so I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of recap. Um, in order to breathe new life into Kratos, we definitely had to focus more on the human side, which we tried to do through the animation by, you know, getting 
uh, more subtlety through motion capture, by uh, getting the right performances in. Um, we, we needed to evolve our animation team to embrace the motion capture technology, but also uh, continue to um, play on the strengths of keyframe animation. And um, you know, because of that, we revamped our, our approach to combat and narrative. And again, you know, finding the right actors for not only the cinematics, but also for your combat uh, motion is essential. But having said that, couldn't have done it with an amazing animation team. Um, they did an amazing job, they, as well as the rest of the team. They really pushed through to get this project out the door, and I really appreciate all their, all their help and effort. Thank you very much. So I think we have around eight minutes or so. If anyone would like to ask any questions, I would, I would uh, really enjoy answering anything you guys may want to know about. Yes. Oh, uh, I believe there's a microphone in the aisles, right? On each side? Yeah. Um, so I was playing through the game. I'm not going to spoil anything. But there was this moment where there was like a big reveal. And then Atreus' face got covered by Kratos' armor. And I had to reset and to uh, strip that away that armor and, and see the scene again just because I wanted to feel. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't see a trail's face in that one. Uh, yeah. Did the team ever uh, consider like, going back or forcing the, uh, like, to use default armor on the scenes or maybe even animating the pieces so that they couldn't block the, the view of your <laughs> cinematics? So that definitely was a big challenge for us because um, this is the first time that you can, you know, armor up Kratos. You know, pretty much play dress up with Kratos. And um, early on, you know, as we were developing the scenes, we knew that there was going to be some there. But once we got the concept and actually the armors were made, there was a lot of situations where we had to deal with that. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't deal with every single situation like the the one you encountered. But um, we did go through some lengths in especially the most critical scenes that we felt we wanted to not have any distractions. And, um, and well, I don't want to steal the thunder from Erica's talk, but she definitely goes into that a little more. But there was, a, uh, there was one particular situation where we, uh, when Kratos is pulling the boat and his son is on the boat and he's pulling, he has a, there's a rope slung over his shoulder, right? So in that, it was so close there that you could see uh, armor clipping depending on what armor you were using. We actually created on a separate layer variable rope animations. I mean, it was maybe five or six different rope animations that would play specifically with what armor you were wearing. <laughs> so that way we could avoid, it would like, okay, play rope animation A with armor sets one through six, you know? <laughs> so, um, so there were situations where we did. Unfortunately, we couldn't get through all of them. But if we were to do this all over again, we would definitely keep that in mind uh, in the future. Okay. Yeah. Thank Great you. Great question. Thank you. Um, uh, hiya. Hi. Uh, so, how challenging was to do seamless transitions into the cinematics to go from gameplay into the actual, into cutscene to have that awesome transition that you did? It was uh, very painful. <laughs> very painful. But over time, we developed a couple of tricks. So. Um, most, a good percentage of the cinematics uh, begin with a player interaction, right? So at least we would know, um, you know, opening a door or, or pulling a lever or something like that, um, we would know that uh, the player, where the player would be and where the camera would be. So that helped with uh, getting into, into cinematics. Uh, the ones that were more challenging were uh, when you were just walking in a certain open area. Um, so for those, we had to do uh, some careful planning of the level uh, layout where you would kind of get funneled into a certain area by the, by the art, you know, where you, as you were walking. And, um, and we had a, a bit of tech that would sort of take over the character, over the player, um, without really, you know, trying to make it as um, non-intrusive to the player. 
But definitely there's moments where you can walk backwards into a scene and the game would kind of take over and like spin you around slowly and walk you into the scene. Um, so, you know, hopefully people didn't do that too much. <laughs> um, probably in the second playthrough when you can anticipate where there's a scene coming, you could probably mess with it a bit. But yeah, it was just, a, it was just careful planning, uh, knowing, um, trying to use the interacts as much as possible and kind of limiting those funnel points uh, where the tech would take over and kind of steer the player into the scene. And did you actually take control of the player to move it into a position? So basically just seamlessly took control from the player and move it to that point. So we actually did, yeah. And we try to make it as subtle and non-intrusive as possible. Very good. Um, and within a reasonable radius so that you didn't feel that you were being cheated. You, know, yeah. you were like getting pulled when you're like, oh, what's going on? My, my controller is not responding anymore. So we try to make it, that's why the funnel points were very important. Yeah. Where like, if you're already walking down a hallway, you already, the player already felt like, okay, well, that's where I meant to go anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, just one question. Mm -hmm. more. Sure. Uh, so uh, how many uh, mock-up sessions you ended up recording in this project? Oh, mock-up sessions, oh, wow. Uh, I don't have the number right at the top of my head, but I think we had around 30 shoot days for cinematics alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Hey, so you mentioned earlier that when you know characters were off the ground that it was keyframed animation. So does that mean all the Valkyrie animations, which were stellar, were those all like hand keyed then? Yeah, so a great majority of those uh, were done by Dennis Pena and yes, they were keyframed. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me you did a great job. Oh yeah, I will. I will, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I have a quick question on facial animation. I hope that's not, that's probably done in another talk, but I'm just curious about some of the biggest lessons learned on getting those facial expressions to read in cinematics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we work with a really great partner, um, Cubic Motion, um, and uh, we were able to send uh, our all data with them to get processed, you know, from the high res videos. Um, so what we did is, once we got the actor's performance back, um, we did an enhanced pass where we wanted to push a couple of things here and there. So we, we, did, we did spend a lot of time. Uh, some scenes were just you know, perfect as is, be driven by the actor's performance. This is why it's just really critical to get uh, really good um, actors to work with you. But uh, definitely, we wanted to, in certain cases, push it a little more. So we did, we did some work to keyframe on top of that as well. What made you all decide to go with the like staggered Peter Jackson style shot in that previs mocap scene as opposed to just having you all right next to each other and fixing it in post? Oh, so that particular one, uh, you're talking about like how we were, how it was being cross dissolved? Yeah. Oh, that was just for, um, I wanted the talk to be under an hour. So um, yeah, but that is actually like a, um, uh, that take is actually done. Um, we, do, we did have one transition that we did while we were doing the previous, but that uh, most, of our, most of our takes were done, like live action takes, were done like the one that I showed with the, uh, the guys on his knees, you know, were like pretty much all in one take. Uh, that particular one with the ogre yeah. was, uh, was cut down for time, but in addition to that, that did have a, a natural uh, uh, cross assault, uh, just because we were just learning, like learning how to do this stuff. Yeah, that was one of the early, early ones that we shot. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, and then if there's no other questions, uh, we are hiring, so please, uh, <laughs> please apply <laughs> if any of you guys are interested. Um, but yeah, I, this is amazing. I'm really happy to have been uh, part of the animation bootcamp finally, and I'm definitely going to enjoy the rest of the talks for the rest of the day, and I hope you guys do as well. So thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.